Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Champaign County in Ohio, a couple of friends and myself had gone out on a Friday night to run one's raccoon dogs. It was a warm night and kind of still. Fall was coming. We decided to head back to L's spot that had a couple of small woods and one large wood that ran north for over a mile. After letting the dogs go through the middle and south woods, we were heading along the fence on the west side of it. From the south woods, to the big north woods. We came across a small area that had no corn growing in it. I happened to look down at the ground with my nightlight and lo and behold, there were two huge footprints. I told the other guys, look at this. We examined the prints and this feeling came over us, at least it did for me. All of a sudden, I felt scared for my life. This is still the most scared I've ever been in my life. As I realized, there was something gigantic out there somewhere that had made these tracks. It was at night, probably around 11 p.m. or so. The siding was along a fence in a cornfield between two woods. We had no gun, as it wasn't hunting season yet, but even if we had, I don't think it would have been any less fearful. We immediately decided the hunting trip is over and quickly made tracks for the truck. I told my dad about our discovery the next day, and he called one of the guys he worked with to come out and see the tracks. This guy had killed bears and about every other large animal in North America, and he said he'd never seen tracks like these. Now, we didn't believe these tracks to be a hoax. The location we found the tracks was so remote that no one would think of planting tracks here in hopes that someone would wander by and see them. No way. We later heard that a creature was spotted on this farm, and it only cemented the fact in my mind that Sasquatch had been there. Afterwards, we had heard that a creature had been spotted earlier that year in the exact field where we had found the tracks that fall. On to the next one. In Union County, Ohio, I had just let the dogs off the leads to track raccoons, and we were following the dogs into the woods. There were six of us. I believe it's been a while, and my memory of the hunting party is not clear. I do know that myself and my second and third cousin heard the same sound, and the dogs came back to the truck, scared, and one of them smelled like a skunk had got to him. There was a loud scream and an awful smell, loud crashing noises in the woods. There were rumors from some of the others in the party about an unusual sound and smell in the area and maybe some footprints that were supposedly found by the creek the week before. This was in a farm field surrounded on three sides by dense wood, with a small creek and an abandoned farmhouse approximately four miles from the wood. I'm unsure of the date, but it was around Halloween. On to the next one. In Tuscarawas County in Ohio, I was deer hunting alone in November. I was 20 years old at the time. I started my hunting trip in the early pre-dawn hours. I walked on a path from the rear of my house into the woods, located on the top of a hill. The wooded area I hunted was remote, with no homes or roads for miles. It contained steep hills, deep rocky ravines, streams, abandoned underground mines, and open farmland. I hunted in this area for several years and only on a rare occasion encountered another hunter. In a short time after I entered the woods, it started to become light, so I decided to stalk hunt deer rather than still hunt in my tree stand. The weather was very cool. There was no wind and the leaves on the ground were damp enough so I could walk through the woods without making noise. I was dressed in camouflage with a fluorescent orange vest and carried a 20-gauge shotgun. 
I continued slowly, making my way deeper into the woods while stopping from time to time. After the sun started to rise, I decided to walk from a pine tree ridge and thick woods near the top of the hill and continued on a deer trail into an opening of small briar patches and waist high brush. The opening was located on the top of the hill in between two deep ravines on either side. The opening was oval shaped, about 80 feet wide by 120 feet long, with wood and brush surrounding it. I started walking slowly into the opening and proceeded about 10 feet, turning my head slowly to the left and right. I had a feeling of uneasiness as I entered the opening. I stopped in my tracks when I observed directly to my left, about 40 feet away, a creature that was black, furry, and had a massive upper body, large shoulders, arms, and head. It was standing at least eight feet high, moving its upper body in a back-and-forth motion in the tree branches surrounding it. It was located a few feet inside the woods that bordered the opening of the waist-high brush and briar patch. There were many smaller trees around it as well as larger ones. The creature started breaking and twisting branches off the smaller trees from the height of its chest on up. I could see the branches moving around it and hear them snapping. At first, I thought it might be a black bear, so I continued to watch. However, the fur was much longer, and the massive upper body shape was more human and not consistent of a bear. It maintained the same shape, standing tall, and continued snapping and twisting the branches without making any other noise. It appeared to have its back to me because I could not see its eyes, or it's possible its eyes may have been blocked by the branches. It definitely was not a black bear. It also was not a human. I stood there staring at its massive size, trying to figure out what it was and why it was snapping and twisting branches. I could not understand or figure out what type of creature it might be. I held my shotgun tight, looking down at the barrel, but the last thing I wanted to do was shoot at something I could not identify. At this point, I felt the need to get out of there. What puzzled me is that the creature either did not realize I was there because it kept on snapping branches, or maybe it didn't care that I was there and was just trying to scare me away. I slowly moved away from the opening and into the woods, and, at a very fast pace, left the area. Ending my hunting trip, I informed my family and close friends of the encounter, but they could not offer an explanation as to what I observed. Seven months later, I read an article in the local newspaper of a person who researched these types of encounters. The article stated that there were other sightings in the surrounding area. The area where I witnessed the creature contained snapped and twisted branches to this day. The only logical explanation of what I experienced is that I encountered a Bigfoot. It is an experience I will never forget. It was between 8.45 to 9 a.m. and the sun was starting to come up. It was very cool and damp out. The sighting was on top of a hill in an open area in between two deep ravines. The area had an abandoned underground mine, pine trees, thick forest, open farmland, and two areas where electrical lines ran through. Seven months after my encounter, I read in the newspaper about other similar sightings in the surrounding area. On to the next one. In 2017, I was camping in one of the Hoosier State's most extensive protected forests for several days. I won't disclose the exact location of my camping site, but I will say that it was deep inside the forest. Typically, when I am backpacking, I'm used to looking for the wildest places with the least amount of people around. I like to enjoy nature, and greedily, I love having the trail to myself for the most part. If I had it my way, I would have the entire forest to myself. That said, this area was selected due to its general isolation in comparison to the rest of the park's regular overnight campsite and much larger family-oriented campgrounds. 
However, it did allow for several other campers and horseback riders to camp in addition to just myself. On this particular trip, I was vamping for the second year in a row. I'd recently switched from using a Chevy Blazer for off-roading in the mountains to a Kia Sedona for cruising around in comfort, and was loving it. Vamping was something I'd always wanted to do, so I was doing it. The minivan was converted into a stealth camper with GPS, Wi-Fi, and all the supplies I needed for a few days at a time. The back seats were removed, a bed was installed, and I had plenty of storage for my gear. When I found a place I liked, I would stop for some time and go for a hike. If I really liked the area, I would hang around for a few days. And if I didn't, well, then I would head on down the road. It's the simple things in life that are so enjoyable. It was in this manner that I found the area I encountered Bigfoot in. I had tried out a couple of different camping sites in the forest that I found pretty ideal at first, but then somewhat lacking after a bit of exploring. The problem with me is, I have a love for the backcountry. Roadside camping is just not for me, and these spots were too close to people for my liking. Just before this event happened, one of my younger brothers had accompanied me on a trip to the same region. Our trip had been a couple of days prior, and about 50 miles further south than the journey I'm describing now. I mention this fact because it was on the earlier expedition with my brother, Colt, that I was studying maps of the area. I'd found a few places on the map that looked promising. Plenty of forests, several trails, and only a few residences within a 45-minute drive from the nearest town. My kind of hiking and camping more or less uninterrupted. After dropping Colt off in Louisville, Kentucky, I headed back across the Ohio River into Indiana and headed straight to the heart of the Hoosier National Forest. Once I got there, I plugged a few campsites into my GPS, cruised around for what turned into about four hours, checking out two or three potential sites. Eventually, I settled for one knowing it would be dark soon and wanting to get out for a walk. That's just what I did. The first couple of days were quiet. There was absolutely no one around, and I took the time to get to know the trails. There were two main trails to choose from, each one of them as isolated as the next in regards to the majority of the park's major trail systems. Also, it's worth mentioning that it was getting late in the season. Summer was turning to autumn, and the trails in the area were mainly for horses to begin. So, when I say no one was there, I mean no one. I particularly enjoyed this aspect. From my camp, one of the trails headed north, I believe, and slightly to the west. However, don't quote me on it if you go searching for Sasquatch based on this encounter. The other trail was a loop leading into one of the deeper parts of this particular national forest. Furthermore, this loop is extremely excluded and has no other paths that crossed it. I spent the better part of the first two days exploring the first of these two trails, and it was quite enjoyable. It connected to the campground several hundred yards away from the Looping Horse Trail. As I said, this loop doesn't intersect with any of the park's other trails, including this one. However, their trailheads are located within eyesight of each other, if you're standing in the right place. I hiked down the first trail for what felt like several miles at the very least. I'm not exactly sure how far it was because, honestly, I had no reason to be documenting anything. I was just enjoying myself and the beauty of the forest. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's the simplest things that are the most enjoyable. 
the trail ran through a heavily forested area with the park. It had slight ups and downs to the terrain, meaning it wasn't flat land, but it definitely wasn't mountainous either. Hilly would be the perfect word to accurately describe this area. I think it's essential to stop for a second and mention that during these first couple of days, I hadn't seen one animal moving about the campground or in the woods surrounding the trails. Even more, I hadn't seen a dead animal either. No carcasses, nothing. On the drive to the campground, the surrounding forest was teeming with life. Just like with most national parks of its size, in fact, I'd almost hit a deer crossing the road and not soon later three large turkeys as well. So, it was strange to me that I hadn't seen a single squirrel, rabbit, deer, bird, or anything. Anyhow, when Friday rolled around, the weather was really lovely, and several people showed up with trucks and trailers to go horseback riding. That's when I moved to the most remote corner of the campground, because I don't like to be crowded. Besides, I had already explored the trails over the previous couple of days, so I left the horseback riders to have the trails for the weekend. At some point that same afternoon, I ran to the nearest town with my camper van to pick up some supplies for the weekend. It was then, while I was driving down that little windy country road that led to the nearest rinky-dink store within a 45-minute drive from the camp, that I saw it. I will never forget the moment. I was multitasking, and that seemed to help me remember things better. So, I had just come around the corner and was watching the road. I was also talking to my wife on the phone and playing with my GPS as well. I was checking my mirrors, the rear view, and the driver's left side when I noticed something moving on the hillside that I was driving by. It had been a couple of days since I saw any animals, so I was eager to see what it was. The hill was wide open for probably about 50 to 100 yards until reaching the trees. Standing just outside of the trees was what I can only describe as a Sasquatch. It was approximately 50 yards away from me, and it was extremely tall, muscular, and covered in long, dark hair. Furthermore, it was huge, just like the stories I'd heard, but not bulky like a gorilla, more like an extremely tall and well-built man. I would guess the thing weighed no less than 300 pounds of solid muscle. I did a double take over my shoulder as I drove by and the image is burnt into my memory forever. I remember my brain trying to rationalize that it couldn't be real. That said, I mentioned to my wife that someone had placed a lifelike Sasquatch statue on the side of the hill, a hill in the middle of nowhere. As I'm telling her this, I realize how ridiculous it sounds. At the time, my brain was still trying to make myself believe that it was some sort of statue and not a real Bigfoot. But at the same time, I was also recalling how its hair was blowing in the wind and how its incredible muscles were bulging like a bodybuilder. I was in total shock. Spending as much time in nature as I do, it wouldn't take much to start to believe the legends are nothing more than stories. I mean, I have spent days, as much as weeks, at a time in the wild. Sure, I have seen some crazy things, but regardless of that fact, seeing a Bigfoot is not something you are expecting to see or that you can possibly prepare yourself for. Somehow, I continued on to the store and collected my supplies without wrecking my van. When I made it back to camp a couple of hours later, I tried to forget about the event again and go on about my day. However, I wasn't able to forget about it so quickly, and I decided to go exploring instead to try to wrap my head around what had actually happened earlier.
Starting with the loop trail that I had yet to entirely hike, I walked down the path for about 45 minutes. I followed the trail until I found a dry creek bed that I gladly decided to pursue. You see, I enjoy hiking along dry creek beds. As I am fully aware, these were the old trails and highways, so to speak, of the ancient people. They didn't use paved roads like we do, so they followed rivers, streams, and game trails. Over the years, I found arrowheads, primitive tools, and all kinds of artifacts in this manner. Simply traveling through these areas and looking for these things that not many, if anyone else, is. Anyhow, I was walking down the creek for roughly two miles or so. I was actively looking for patches of fur and the signs of any sort of trail, basically anything that might indicate something as big or even larger than a human traveling through the area. That said, I did a few curious trails, but they soon disappeared due to the rocky surface. Other than a few rocks that could have been primitive tools, I didn't see anything else all that interesting besides the few ghost trails I'd found. Eventually, I lost my interest, feeling defeated and turned back. I then made a couple of hours hike up the creek bed, down the trail, and back towards camp. When I finally got back to the beginning of the trailhead and started crossing the campground toward my van, I noticed a buck step out of the woods on the opposite side of the forest. It was the first living creature I had seen aside from on the drive. The deer stepped into the gravel road that circled around the campground and stared directly at me. I looked right back at it, and we both just stood there looking at each other. After what seemed like a few minutes, but more than likely nothing more than a few seconds, the deer turned its head back towards the wood that it had just come from and walked off, disappearing into the trees. I continued on back to my campsite, feeling oddly strange about the encounter. The next day, I didn't really feel much like hiking, so I piddled around the camp a little bit for a change. I had a campfire, carved a bit, sipped some strong coffee, and had a meal. I decided to take a rest at some point, partially due to still feeling strangely let down from the day before, so I climbed inside of the van to stretch out. I was laying there for a moment, thinking about how many nuts must have fallen out of this tree and hit the van since I'd been in it this weekend, when I realized that they weren't falling out of the tree at all. Rather, that they were actually hitting the side of the van instead, and that someone or something must have been throwing them. Shivers ran up and down my spine as I remembered what I had seen earlier that day on the hillside as I was driving to town for supplies. I sat up, immediately no longer feeling secure in the safety of my van. I was parked less than 50 feet away from the edge of the forest, and about the same for my fire pit. There was a rather large tree, some sort of oak, I believe, standing between the van and the fire pit. That said, when I got out of the van and stood up straight, a walnut or a crab apple came flying out of the woods and smashed into this tree. It hit the tree hard with a capital H, so hard, in fact, that the thing bounced a good 25 feet off the tree's trunk and then rolled another 50 feet further before coming to a full stop. I remember my first thought about the flying object impacting the tree was at the speed, accuracy, and the power behind it. My second thought was that my face would have been just as easy for whoever threw that to hit it. Immediately, I looked all around me, but of course, there was no one there. I also realized at the time that while I was napping, the very last person camping other than myself had left the campground. I was the only human being around for miles. Let me clarify, 
I was the only person actually camping the entire weekend to begin with. Everyone else who came into this area during the time of the story simply drove into the area, made their way around the loop, and then left. Alternatively, they came with trucks and trailers and went horseback riding on the trails. But now, I was the only one in the area. The one person that significantly stood out among the rest of the crowd over the weekend was a man driving a golden van, much like mine, with blacked out tinted windows. He was playing loud classical rock music and wearing dark sunglasses. This was the individual who had disappeared while I was napping. He was the last person to leave the campground that weekend other than me and was the only other person who hadn't been horseback riding. This guy hadn't been hiking either. I don't know actually what he'd been doing other than parking directly across from me and listening to loud music since shortly after my Bigfoot sighting. When I stepped out of the van and that thing smashed into the tree, I quickly realized that I was alone with this thing. Things in actuality. I just wasn't aware yet that there was more than one out here. I also rationalized rather swiftly that this thing had waited for the right moment to get my attention. As crazy as it seemed, it, or more appropriately, they had waited until every last truck, trailer, and horse had left, including the mystery guy with the golden van, before tossing rocks at my van's windows. Now, I've never claimed to be the brightest crayon in the box, that is for sure, but this didn't take a genius to figure out. Or maybe it did, and you're gonna think I'm an idiot, because I thought the correct thing to do was run straight into the woods, the same direction the rocks and walnuts had come from, and search for who or what had thrown them. I've never shielded away from unusual experiences. Quite opposite. I saw this as a unique opportunity. I wanted to get to the bottom of just what in the world was going on around here. Was it all somehow an elaborate hoax, after all? I didn't know, but I sure planned on finding out. I charged into the nearest section of woods to my camp, like a moron, carrying a five-foot staff as if it would do anything to a single Bigfoot, let alone a pack of them. Thankfully for me, but, to my utter dismay, there was nothing to be seen in the forest edge. I stood still, listening and waiting, but I never heard a peep from anything but creaking trees. In hindsight, and in 100% honesty, it never occurred to me what I might have seen if I had just looked up into the treetops. But it wasn't meant to be because the thought didn't cross my mind. Instead, I swung my head from side to side, scanning every tree, trunk, branch, log, and rock in sight for even the slightest bit of movement. Heart beating and nothing showing, I walked around the edge of the woods a bit more and then headed back to my camp, bewildered. No one else showed up to the campground that night, and I never heard anything else that night either. However, what happened the very next morning is actually the most interesting part of the story, if you ask me. On my last morning at the Hoosier National Forest, I was sitting by my campfire, sipping on some hot coffee, trying to wake up. I always carry an old-fashioned percolator to make my campfire coffee. Those old-style percolators make coffee like nothing else on this planet. If you've ever had a good campfire coffee, you'll know exactly what I mean. If not, I'm sorry for your luck. I had been awake for around 30 minutes when I began to faintly hear a car engine several miles in the distance. It was probably several miles away because of the way the roads were laid out. It would have been literally impossible for a vehicle to approach the campgrounds without being able to hear it for quite some time. The sun was just starting to come up, rather was just about to come up, so you still couldn't see it yet. I remember the color of the sky that morning. It was turning light gray when I first heard the car. It must have been somewhere slightly after 6 a.m. 
possibly even closer to 7 a.m. I stood up from my fire and was stretching out when I noticed the sound of the car continuing to come closer and closer. At this point, it must have been hardly a mile or two out from the camp and closing in quickly. This was when things got a little bit weird, even for me, and all that I've seen in my travels. Two things happened that changed my worldview forever. As I mentioned before, I was camped very closely to the woodline. The main trail that I'd been hiking was no more than 20 feet away from where I laid my head down in the van to sleep which is something I usually never do, sleep so close to a public trail. You never know who or what might come down that trail and catch you napping. Believe me, I have heard some horror stories about people disappearing from nature parks. I was breaking my rule because I was armed and had locking doors, whereas I usually slept in a tent far away from any trail. The reason I take the time to explain this is because of what happened next. If I hadn't been standing on the edge of the woods, practically inside of it, I doubt that I would have been able to hear what I did. Fate would have it that what happened next I not only heard, but heard it so vividly it haunts me to this day. The car came nearer to our location and two distinct noises began almost simultaneously. Within a split second, a third noise added to the strange symphony of sounds not so softly blowing my unbelieving mind. The first sound was not so strange as it was frightening. A half yell, half scream, for lack of better terminology. I mean, it sounded exactly like every person who has ever claimed to have heard Bigfoot said it was. Something between man and animal. Something not human, but not creature either. Something more, and whatever it was, it sounded pissed off. The thing screamed or shouted, however you want to look at it, three times. It was blood-curdlingly loud. I was entirely beside myself, as if I were dreaming for a moment due to the bizarre nature of the entire trip. But I soon snapped back to myself. Several large branches began to break from several directions out in the forest, barely beyond my parked van. When I say large branches, I mean massive because I could hear them snapping from great distances as they steadily moved further into the depths of the forest. Some of the noises were much nearer than the others, but many of them sounded like they were on the other side of the most adjacent hills surrounding the camp. As I stood there, the sound of the branches breaking ascended the nearest hills, and then promptly descended the opposite side, yet all obviously going in the same direction. The exact direction that the screams, or calls if you will, had come from momentarily, before the branches started breaking. My mind was blown again. Had this thing just summoned the others to it with those three horrifying shouts, it sure looked like it. If I had to guess, each branch that broke was located somewhere from the middle to the top of the trees. None of them were low branches. And we're not talking about small trees here. This incident was in a national forest, which is federally protected and has some rather old trees. Specifically, in this part of the forest, the trees are rather large and have lots of thick upper branches. I would also guess that the distance between each sound of breaking branches was probably somewhere around 10 to 20 yards. It's impossible for me to gauge. However, I've spent years in the wilderness. Anyone who knows me will tell you that my judgment of time and distance is usually pretty accurate, so I'll stick by those numbers. No doubt whatever it was, it would have been rather large, strong, and agile not to mention that there had been several of them out there. And not only that, I realized with dread, but apparently a number of the things had been out there in the woods, extremely close to my campsite, basically surrounding it on two sides. And I was completely unaware until that car came down the road. Had they been there the entire night? Had they followed me back from the day before when I'd spent a few hours searching the forest for signs of them? 
I was chilled to the bone as I listened to the receding tree branches snapping with force of whatever was swinging, jumping, or otherwise moving from tree to tree. Whatever they were, they were moving extremely quickly. It couldn't have taken them more than a few seconds to cover an entire hill that would have taken a man several minutes to walk up. I mean literally 10 seconds, 15 seconds top. And whatever were moving through the trees were gone from the edge of my campsite and entirely out of my hearing range. I'm aware these events may not seem so alarming. However, if you were there, you'd without a doubt understand exactly how unnerving such a situation can be. Likewise, if you've ever encountered something similar, you can imagine how terrifying yet intriguing these sorts of things can be. So, to backtrack for just a minute, I purposefully neglected to mention one of the most critical aspects of that moment's happening. And in fact, to be perfectly honest, the branches of the trees breaking was, in my opinion, a direct response to what I am about to explain. That morning, as I stood stretching with my cup of coffee in hand, when I heard that car coming, the insanely creepy three howling screams and the branches breaking, I listened to an additional sound as well. My brain, however, was having trouble interpreting and accepting the noise for what it really was. A drum. Yup. You heard that correctly. I heard as clear as day what sounded by all means to be a large drum beating in the distance. It rang out several times, spaced smoothly in an even rhythm. The drum beat in the distance. Yet, it was close enough that I could plainly hear its low and powerful beat. It was unmistakably a drum. There was no question about it. If you've had the pleasure of attending a Native American powwow or visiting an authentic drumming circle, you would know how it's hard to mistake a tribal-sounding drum beat. And that's precisely what I was hearing. A simple but steady tribal thundering drum beat. The moment the car was within a quarter of a mile's proximity to the campground, the drum abruptly stopped. The branch breaking had ended as well. As bizarre of a situation as it was, and genuinely surreal in any event, what was happening somehow made perfect sense to me. These things had been lurking at the edges of my camp for what reasons I don't know sounded an alarm at the oncoming vehicle to which they all retreated together, all of those branches breaking, moving away in the same direction of the drum and the three howls. There were more than one of them. I would guess there were at least three, but more than likely closer to five or more. Those numbers are an educated guess. Based on the sound of breaking branches coming from more than one direction simultaneously, and the fact the sounds moved rhythmically throughout the forest. Individually, but obviously together. I can't say for sure how many there were. I would be lying if I claimed otherwise. What I can say for sure is that they were moving incredibly fast and sounded large. I don't know of any animal in that part of the country that is capable of breaking branches like that. Even more, covering those amounts of distance in that short amount of time is basically impossible as far as I know. And don't get me started on the drum, because honestly, I would really love nothing more than to know what the heck that was all about. I know what I saw during that trip to the Hoosier National Forest, and I know what I experienced. That's all there is to it. If I were a Bigfoot Sasquatch, or some other type of being besides a human living in this world, I would probably want my privacy too. I mean, come on. It's not like us humans have such a good track record of sharing or exactly being such great friends to the environment, let alone to each other. I will be the first one to admit that I have no idea what a Bigfoot is. Popular theories propose that Bigfoot could be an alien race, a relative of the Neanderthal, or even creatures that walked between dimensions. I have no idea what Bigfoot is, but I do know they are real. 
for many reasons, including the fact that I don't know what Bigfoot is, and I would hate to bring undue harm to something I don't understand, I've decided to keep the exact location and the precise date of the events a secret. There is one last thing then I found really strange about the entire situation. Between the previous night and the morning of this trip, the full moon reached its zenith. That said, I'm not sure the moon plays into all of that or if it does at all. I'm not claiming that it makes a difference or has anything to do with it, but in the same breath, I'm not counting it out either. All in all, I'm not making any claims as to what I saw or experienced at that national park over that five days of time. Quite the opposite, I'm left with more questions than anything. On to the next one. I was driving home to Columbia, South Carolina from Georgetown, South Carolina. It was around 12 a.m. when I saw something standing on the side of the road. It was on the right side of the road. I saw what looked like a little fox running down the side of the road, then run across the highway, followed by something dark and shaggy. In appearance, at first, standing still, then leaping across the highway into the woods from right to left. I had to swerve a little to the right because I was scared I might hit it as it went across in front of me. I didn't get a good look at it because it happened very fast. I was going around 60 miles per hour. Its hair may have been a reddish auburn color. The hair wasn't really long and it was kind of matted. The hair under the arms of the animal may have been a little lighter than the rest of the hair on the body. It was about the size of a large man, maybe bigger, six to seven feet tall. I can say it got my adrenaline pumping. The creature was on two feet, standing upright. It leapt across the highway in a long stride or a leap from the right side of the highway, landing not quite clear of the left side lane and another stride took it into the trees on the left side and out of view as I passed. Whatever it was, it was big and fast moving. I thought it might be a bear at first, but it seemed very manlike and kind of slender or lanky in a way, not round and thick like a bear. What really freaked me out was that its eyes caught and reflected the headlights so that they glowed as it went by. I'm just baffled by the whole event and I was kind of spooked the rest of the way home. I had the vent on in the car and the radio playing. When I smelled something like a dead animal and a little before I saw anything, the smell was almost like that of gangrene. It looked like it turned its head toward the car as it jumped. I saw two amber-colored eyes reflected in the headlights. On to the next one. near Fort Mill in York County, South Carolina. The terrain was open hardwoods, with cornfields on one side, cut over and set pines on the other. I've had two encounters with Bigfoot. The first, I passed off as a big cat or a really big owl. The second, I was standing within six feet of it. What I saw was a large human shape covered with black hair. It had an extremely large chest and forearm areas. I didn't see a face, only a large head outline. Let me explain the whole thing as one directly affects the other. I hunt. You name it, I've hunted it. I've been in the woods all my life. I've never been afraid of anything. Never seen any little green men or UFOs, but I have seen Bigfoot. The first time was in late October. I was in a deer stand. I got there early and stayed late. I didn't see anything. As I was about to climb down for the evening, I heard a really loud howl or hoot, something I had never experienced before, and it was close. I sat back down, trying to figure out. Then it did it again, this time closer and this time louder and longer. I thought maybe a panther off the refuge or maybe a big owl. The next time, I tried to figure out its location and shined the only light I had in that direction. A small mini-mag flashlight. 
but nothing, and it went silent. I climbed down quickly. It really let out a howl or whatever then. I turned and fired one round in the general direction of the sound. Then silence again. Like I said, it was close, fifty yards at the most and, more likely, thirty yards. I had close to half a mile to walk to my truck and, on the way, thinking what in the world could that have been. I never heard anything like that for sure and not that loud. I told my brother, who studied wildlife biology, and he seemed to think it was some kind of cat, but I knew better and didn't dare doubt his education. Now it's a new season, and I'm back in the same location, not far from where this event happened. I've been in the stand twice, and I haven't had any problem like sounds I couldn't identify. Then it happened. I stayed in the stand late because I hadn't seen any deer, and I wanted to see if possibly they had gone nocturnal on me. Still nothing. So I started down, untied my rifle, flung it across my shoulder, got my flashlight out of my pouch, turned around, and poof, out of nowhere. I had not heard a thing. He, she, it was standing not six feet from me. My light hit it about halfway between its private and its chest. The skin on my face and head got so tight and I froze. I could not move. I wanted to look up, but I was afraid to make any kind of movement as it was way too close for me to get my rifle off my shoulder before it would have been on me. I could feel its size and strength in the air. Then it made some kind of movement, almost like crossing its arms loosely. I started running backwards as fast as I could while reaching for my gun. The creature made a deep hugging sound and was gone just as fast as it had appeared. Remember, all this happened in about 30 seconds. There was no bad smell, and I haven't been back there to see if there are any tracks. On to the next one. Shortly before the 18th of October in 1879, two young men hunting in the Green Mountain of South Williamstown in Orange County, Vermont, saw a wild hairy man about five feet tall. The creature was covered in bright red hair, had a straggling beard and very wild eyes. When first seen, the creature had suddenly sprung at them from behind a rocky cliff and started for the nearby woods. Mistaking it for a bear, one of the men fired at it, and, with fierce cries, possibly of pain or rage, it turned on its attackers and chased them at high speed. The two men lost their guns and ammunition in their haste to escape, and dared never to return to the area in case they ran into the creature again. On to the next one. A man, his mother, father, and sister-in-law saw a hairy, man-like head peering at them over bushes. The man yelled at the animal, which ran off with an inhuman gait. This was in Fairhaven in Rutland County in Vermont. On to the next one. Near Colchester in Crittenden County in Vermont. Between 12 and 1 a.m. on the night my niece was born, there was a snowstorm. My brother-in-law had a custom car and wanted to go home to Milton to switch to his older car because of the sudden snow. My husband, my brother-in-law, my nephew, three years old, and myself drove from Milton. We were headed down to my house in Winoski. We got as far as Colchester, when the snow got real bad and the car slid into a ditch. My nephew began to cry and scream, so we flagged down a truck to bring me and my nephew to my house to call a tow truck. I left my husband and brother-in-law in Colchester. My husband said while they were waiting, they started to hear noises in the woods like trees breaking. Then they heard something that was coming in their direction, but it was stomping on two legs they could hear the breaking trees coming closer. My husband is a hunter, 
and he said you could tell it was walking on two legs. They backed away from the side of the road to the other. They couldn't run because the road was too slippery, and they only had on sneakers. Meanwhile, it kept getting closer. It was starting to part the trees when the tow truck came, and they heard it running back into the woods, breaking everything in its path. My husband was very scared. They both were and told me what had happened. I half believed them. The next day, I drove through the same place and looked around as I drove. I saw fields and woods and thought that it looked too peaceful and I really thought they were nuts. I had to pick up my husband in Milton. I had my daughters with me who were 10 and 13. I was pregnant at that time. Anyway, I got to Milton later that night and we were headed back to Winooski. Well, wouldn't you know it, it started to snow really hard like the night before and it was midnight. We started to go through the same spot as the night before and I started to tell my husband about me looking around earlier and that there was nothing. Well, there it was. It just crossed the road and started to go up a hill. It was staring at us with one foot on a wire fence holding the wire down with its arm and just staring at us. It was not brown, but white with yellow dirty streaks and his eyes, oh, how they scared me. They were reflecting a yellow amber color, like the yellow on caution lights. It was a huge man. It was at least 10 feet tall. The arms were very long and his fur was long. On his face, the only flesh part that didn't have fur was his eyes and upper cheeks. My husband started to slow down to get a better look. That's when I freaked out and started to hit my husband because I was so scared and my girls were screaming, so we kept on going. I just kept on thinking about its eyes and was afraid, so we wondered if they knew that it's there and we don't want to get shot looking. Since we saw it, I can't help but wonder if they are like jackrabbits, brown during the summer and white in the winter because of the snowstorms each night. It made it impossible to find tracks. The first night we ran off the road into the ditch. The next night we were on our way home. From where it crossed the road, it was a mountain ridge and a swampy area in between. Where it was headed was a hill going to pines and then beyond that was fields and woods again. Maybe during winter, Bigfoot is harder to see as its color changes, the same color as some Arctic and non-Arctic animals. On to the next one. My first introduction to Bigfoot was about a series of articles in the Portland Oregonian, the Salem Statesman Journal, the San Francisco Chronicle, and at least one other. I saved these articles in a folder as a sort of junior high science project. We even talked about it in a class a couple of times, with much scoffing by the teacher, even though he did say there are many things which science does not understand or has even discovered. One of the articles from the Chronicle stated that a young Bigfoot had been captured in the late 1880s and put in a freak side show. According to the article, it could break a stout hardwood stick about three to six inches in diameter like a matchstick. For some reason or other, it died and the body disposed of. How it was disposed of or where was unknown. Apparently, the animal was in the sideshow in a steel barred cage for a few years. Just how many years that was is also unknown. An artist's drawing was also printed and supposedly dated back to the time this thing was caged. According to the newspapers, these articles were dated back to the 1880s. There was also a story from the Oregonian that a well-known scientist from the University of Oregon had announced he was going to attempt contact with these beings by parachuting into the wilderness somewhere between Grant Pass and the Calamopus Wilderness Area. I believe that in the late 1970s or early 1980s, an expedition was formed to go out and look for the scientist. I remember reading that remnants of his tent and a very old campsite were found, but 
there was no sign of the scientist himself. Who knows? There were also stories about mysterious attacks that occurred during the construction of Interstate 5 near the top of Mount Ashland. In 1964-65, to 65, workers found several earth movers with their tires and wheels completely ripped off the machine. Hubs and all, a man who had been a close friend of my family's in Calumet Falls before we moved to Ashland work at Pape Cat in Medford. They had the contract to repair and maintain the equipment used for the construction on the road. He told us that, and this was confidential, something had ripped the wheels off, and 55-gallon drums had holes punched in them like a big fist. He said the state police were investigating vandalism, but since it would have been very hard for any humans to get the equipment, and no humans had that kind of strength or ability, they were not sure what they were dealing with. The investigation died for lack of evidence and construction continued. It was not an isolated case. That same kind of incident happened three or four times. Then. After the highway was completed into California, the story was told of a man traveling north in a blinding snowstorm over the top of the Siskiyou Pass or Summit. He claimed he was headed down the mountain toward Ashland when something landed on the hood of his car. The snow was more like a blizzard and the headlight reflected back at him. He saw a shape like a human and a face looking at him through the windshield. He thought he hit someone. After a second or two, the thing rolled over off the hood, disappearing into the snow and the night. When the man got to South Ashland exit, he went into a gas station. He told the attendant to fill up while he got a cup of coffee. He was really rattled and did not tell anyone he probably killed a person. When he came back with coffee, the attendant asked how the hood on the car had gotten such a huge dent right in the middle, and he wondered what all the hair around the edge of the hood was. At least, to the attendant, it looked like hair. Those, such as they were, were the stories reported in the newspaper. A friend and I, both fifteen, decided to hike up the old Ashland Mine Road. We had a Boy Scout camp coming up in April or May of that year and wanted to prepare for a five-mile hike we knew was coming. My mother drove us to the top of Mountain Street, where the Ashland watershed is. We found fresh snow on the ground, about three or four inches deep. There were other people sledding. My friend and I began hiking. The snow was fresh, and there were no tracks in the snow ahead of us. Remember that. No track, period. We hiked up the road with many twists and turns as it climbed up the mountainside. Near the end of the second mile, we came to a climbing right-hand 90-degree turn. As the road leveled out, we came upon some track, big track. My friend and I stopped and looked around thinking perhaps some other human was in the area. But as we compared our prints side by side with those we found, we realized these were not human. There was about a three to four inch difference in foot size, I wore an 11 size boot. In other words, these tracks were huge in comparison. They were not bare tracks and the strides were not human either. From the tip of the toes to the heel of the footprint ahead was about 9 to 10 feet. It was hard to measure since we were not carrying a measuring tape nor were we expecting anything like this. Then we put the heel of our boot next to the toe of the footprint and stepped off the distance between the print. It was nearly three paces, or nine feet. We tried to stretch our steps to match, but there was no way we could reach that far in one single step. We observed what appeared to be three pads at the front of the print, sort of like pads of a dog has under its claws. It was kind of shaped like a peanut, but I cannot remember which side of the foot the pad was, either the right front quadrant or the left front. Anyway, we began to get frightened. The hair on our neck was standing up, and we both got the creep. My friend looked at me and said, I bet these are Bigfoot tracks. 
I said it could not be, not this close to civilization, especially since down the hill to our left, about three quarters of a mile, were some secluded homes on the southern edge of Ashland. My friend looked at me and said the area we were standing was considered rugged mountains, and Bigfoot lives in areas like that. That did not help my frame of mind anyway. We observed the animal had come down a 10 to 12 foot embankment at a 15 degree incline. We both began to suspect someone was playing tricks on us, but we could not figure out who, since no one except our parents knew we were out there. We plucked up our courage and continued on up the road following the footprint. We followed the tracks about another two miles. As we came up around another climbing 90 degree turn to the right, we observed the tracks had stopped and the animal appeared to be looking back down the road toward us. We then observed little clumps of snow rolling down the eight foot embankment to our right and the bushes at the top were wiggling. The bushes at the top of the embankment were pretty thick and this thing could be hiding behind the bushes up there. We took one look at the tracks, the snow coming down the embankment, and the moving bush, and we realized that whatever it was had jumped up the hill. There were no tracks from that side of the road to the top of the embankment. We departed in haste, over the high side to our left, and down the hill as far and as fast as we could go. We decided not to mention this to anyone because they would not believe us. My next encounter came a few months later. As my friend and I prepared to go on this Boy Scout outing, we pledged to keep our silence about the previous experience. In late March or early April of 1966, we went with our Boy Scout leader, one of whom worked for the U.S. Forest Service. We went out into the woods behind Talent, Oregon. It was somewhere around 30 miles or so into the brush, as we like to call it. Out there is an old trapper's cabin that the Forest Service used as a shelter or a campsite when doing surveying work. The building itself was said to be historic, but unusable. We set up our tents within 20 to 30 yards of the cabin, but my friend and I got into an argument with the leadership and decided to put our tent on the far side of the cabin by ourselves. We had a meeting around a big campfire when it got dark. We ate dinner and then the leaders decided to take us on a snipe hunt. After about an hour or so of wandering around in the brush for several hundred yards, much shouting and yelling, we headed back to camp. My friend and I built a campfire outside our tent and roasted some marshmallows. The leader came by and told us to get to bed as we needed some sleep for the five-mile hike the next day. As we got into our sleeping bag, my friend made the remark that he hoped no Bigfoots would bother us. That got my attention. About 30 minutes later, we were snuggled into our bag when this big shadow went between the fire and our tent. We both saw what appeared to be a shaggy, somewhat stooped over figure walk between the fire and our tent. At that point, we got very acquainted with the bottom of our sleeping bags. We laid there wide awake and scared to death. At one point, I noticed that my sleeping bag was under the tent, outside of the tent. I scooted back as far as I could go to get back inside when my air mattress scraped across a nail sticking out of the backpack and pow, the mattress exploded. It scared the out of both of us and my friend nearly killed me. It is funny now and you can laugh at it now, but then it was terrifying. I was afraid this thing outside was waiting to get me. As I look back on it now, I realized that if it was a Bigfoot, its curiosity was simply that, curiosity. If indeed it was a Bigfoot, it simply went between the fire and the tent on its way to somewhere else. Very early in the morning, near daylight, we heard some banging in the stable attached to the trapper cabin. We thought it might be one of the other boys looking for a place to go to the bathroom. When we got up, we looked out and saw nothing. So we checked the fire. Sure enough, there were several big prints in the soft earth about five feet from the fire. We tried to tell our Boy Scout leader what we had found, but he laughed and said he had been over there. We asked when, and he said about an hour after we went to bed, after when we had seen the shadow. 
His prints were closer to the tent than the prints of the shadow. My next encounter came. I was working for the Forest Service as a lookout on Mount Emily, just outside Brookings, Oregon. You can look up at Mount Emily from Brookings. It was only about 10 miles in a straight line as the crow flies, but by road, it is about 60 miles. I had a black lab I called Bucky. He lived with me on the tower. This was a 25-foot tower from the ground to the catwalk. One evening in July, I had to go down the mountain because I had a doctor's appointment and needed to get some groceries. I locked Bucky on the tower with the intention of being back on the mountain early the next morning. Bucky did not like being alone, and he apparently jumped off the tower. When I got back the next morning, Bucky was gone. I called and called, looking for his track, but found nothing. It got lonely up there for the next two weeks. I presumed Bucky was badly injured in his jump and had crawled off somewhere and died. I gave up hope. About ten days later, I heard a noise in the late evening sunset down off the hill I was on. And sure enough, I saw Bucky. He was very tired and worn out. He was panting so hard I thought he was going to die. I carried him up the tower and into the chart room and laid him on the bed. After about an hour, he got up and went to drink. He drank three full bowls of water before he was done. He crawled back up on the bed and went to sleep. Never, and I mean never, barked or growled. He just did not. He was so mild and good-natured, he just didn't carry on like most dogs. That is why he was such a good companion. After that incident, he never left my side. He stuck to me like glue. He did not want to be left alone. If I had to go to the outhouse, he would sit outside the door and whine until I was done. He was scared, very scared. He took to sleeping under my bunk. He never did that before. He would also take to barking in the early and late evening. He would stand there on the catwalk looking down at the mountains to the southwest and bark and bark and bark. He had never done that before, either. About two weeks later in the early evening, I was scanning the woods with my binoculars when I heard a ripping, tearing sound. The kind of sound a dead tree made. It was not a widow maker falling because it was not a thump. It sounded more like the sound you would hear ripping up a dead rotting tree. I knew it was not a bear opening up a dead tree looking for grubs because there are no bears on that mountain. The Indians used to bury their dead up there and call it the mountain of the god because it seemed to be always enshrouded in fog or cloud. In fact, the only animals I ever saw up there in the two years I spent on the mountain as a lookout were a few rats, a couple of chipmunks, and me. Occasionally, I would have a human visitor, but most of the time, I was totally and completely alone. I went down the tower and walked in the direction of the sound. I searched for quite some time while Bucky stayed on the tower and barked. He was really frightened. I had my rifle with me, but... I never found where the sound came from, nor did I see any sign of what made the sound. Several days later, in the late evening, about 10.30 or so, we were both trying to sleep. The full moon was setting on the horizon, and the whole tower was lit up. It was very warm. The temperature had been in the high 90s for several days. I opened the windows to let whatever breeze there was blow through the window and out the door. As I laid on the bunk, there was a huge boom, and the whole tower shook. It felt like a car had run into the tower, or perhaps a sonic boom. But the tower shook first. Something had hit the tower. My first reaction was to grab my gun, because several of the other lookouts in the district around Grants Pass and Cape Junction had been getting pot shot by environmentalists and pot growers. Word had been quietly spread by Forest Service officials that while it was not an official order, we could, if we were so inclined, arm ourselves for protection. Since we were so far out in the boonies, it would take hours for anyone to come to our aid, even if we did call in by radio for help. I crawled out the window to the catwalk and belly crawled around the tower, looking to see if anyone might be down below. Bucky was under the bed, 
with every hair on his body standing straight up and growling so deep in his throat, I thought he was going to bleed. I've never in my life had seen an animal so scared. He actually evacuated poop and urine right there on the floor under the bed. His eyes were actually drained of all color, much like those of a husky. The irises were actually white. He was scared to death. It took me hours to coax him from under the bed, and he hardly recognized me. I remember I had not seen any car lights approaching the mountain, and since the last two miles of the road could only be traveled by foot, four-wheel drive, or mountain bike, I knew that fact if anybody would be nuts enough to make that climb in the dark, let alone during daylight. Those boulders were big enough to rip wheels off or oil pans out of a vehicle unless great care and skill were used to get up that road during the day, let alone at night. Whatever it was had slammed the tower and disappeared. Now, let me say this. The lookout tower, which is gone now, stood at the top of the mountain and a good 360 degree view of the district at, in all directions. As you look due west, the mountain goes out about 50 to 60 yards and begins to drop off the Chetco River below. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!